Good evening. I'm Fiona Branton, president of the Harvard Law School Forum, and I'd like to welcome you all here tonight. Before we get, begin tonight's program, I'd like to make a few announcements. Uh, first, we'd like to acknowledge the kind generosity of Mr. Jerry Rappaport and his family who are sponsoring tonight's event. Next, uh, due to a job-related commitment, Larry King will not be able to be with us next week as originally scheduled. Um, on November 19th, we will present Arturo Cruz, a one-time Sandinista and a former Contra leader, who will speak on why he left the Contras. Tickets for that event will be on sale in the Hark next week. On November 24th, we will have Sheikh Ahmed Yamani, the former OPEC oil minister, and on December 8th, Oliver Stone, the Oscar-winning director of Platoon. Tonight's format, as always, will consist of remarks by Mr. Giuliani, followed by questions and answers from the audience. We ask that when you ask questions, please use the microphones on either side of the room. We're pleased to have with us a special guest to introduce Mr. Giuliani tonight, one who needs very little introduction himself at this institution, Professor Alan Dershowitz. Professor Dershowitz is in his 24th year of teaching here at the law school, specializing in the areas of criminal law, constitutional litigation, civil liberties and violence, legal ethics, and human rights. Besides teaching, he's written numerous books and articles, and he has litigated a wide variety of cases, some of them very controversial. Uh, I'm pleased to present Professor Dershowitz. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. It's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Rudy Giuliani to you. Many of you, of course, have heard him and have heard of him or read his work product in various cases uh, in law school. Uh, about Rudy, I can say that he is one of the very, very few baby boomers I know who could actually survive a Supreme Court nomination. But... <laughs> At the fear of ruining his chances of ever getting on the Supreme Court, I want to make two points. One which is probably irretrievable in terms of a loss. That is, I would support him if he ever got nominated to the Supreme Court. But the second, in all honesty, I would have to reveal a major vice, character flaw. Rudy Giuliani was born in Brooklyn. That is trouble enough. But born in Brooklyn, he nonetheless became, I shudder to say it, a New York Yankee fan. Now, when I was growing up in Brooklyn, there was nothing more insidious, more to be loathed than a native Brooklyn-born person who rooted for the New York Yankees. I think it was Ira Glasser, who is now the director of the Civil Liberties Union, who said that the politics of my generation, the pre-baby boomer generation, was formed by our allegiance to the Brooklyn Dodgers, rooting year after year for losers, finally getting a winner, only to have them leave and go to Los Angeles. Well. To have to stand up here and introduce somebody who is always supported, the wealthy, the bullies of the world, the team that won every year that beat us in the World Series in 1951, in 1953, over and over and over again. I think I understand why my politics led me to defend the downtrodden the prosecutor in the Reagan administration. But about 15 years ago when he was president of the I Love Lucy fan club. I Love Lucy fan club had nothing to do with television. There was a witness in a very important case in New York named Robert Lucy. Any of you who saw the movie Prince of the City may remember him as Danny Cella. They changed his name. Robert Lucy was a wonderful witness and he did a terrible thing. He put one of my clients in prison for a crime which he deserved to go to prison for. But nonetheless, he put him in prison. <laughs> in the process, he did what many government witnesses did. He told the truth about the merits of the case, but he lied about his own background. And we discovered that he lied about his background, 
And we brought a new trial motion and tried to get the conviction reversed. And in fact, it was Rudy Giuliani who got him ultimately to fess up and to disclose his prior lies. But then there were those in the U.S. Attorney's Office. Rudy was only at that time a mere young new assistant U.S. Attorney. There were those in the office who wanted to prosecute Lucy. And there were those who wanted not to prosecute Lucy. And those who were on Lucy's side became known as the I Love Lucy fan club. That view prevailed. Lucy was not prosecuted, and he ended up lecturing at law schools and universities around the country, including Harvard, several years ago. Well, since that time, Rudy Giuliani and I have mostly been on the opposite sides of cases. Uh, most recently, he tried and won the Stanley Friedman prosecution in New York, actually in New Haven, Connecticut. I think if it had been in New York, he probably wouldn't have won it, but he won it in New Haven, Connecticut. And uh, I recently argued the appeal. Uh, against uh, that office, and we wait and see which side justice will come out on. I'm always reminded of the story of the lawyer who cabled his client, justice has prevailed, and the client cabled back, appeal immediately. Well, <laughs> but we're not always on the opposite side of issues and cases. Uh, I want to commend uh, Rudy Giuliani. I think he has been uh, the very best uh, United States attorney for the city of New York. He has managed to uh, penetrate the inner sanctums of the mafia, the inner sanctums of uh, Wall Street, the inner sanctums of City Hall. I have publicly challenged him a few times and I will challenge him again tonight. Why, if you're so good at figuring out what conversations are being whispered in the bathrooms of City Hall, in the pizza parlors of downtown New York, in the boardrooms of Wall Street, why can't you figure out who leaked the information to the press that Bess Meyerson took the Fifth Amendment a couple of months ago? Why can't you get to the bottom of what's going on inside the Justice Department and inside the U.S. Attorney's Office? I'm sure that's a question that Rudy Giuliani will answer. We haven't always been <laughs> on different sides of the issues either on the merits of prosecutions. I think it's been terrific that the emphasis on white collar crime has finally caught on at the Justice Department and that Rudy has been willing to prosecute with equal fervor uh, street pushers of drugs and organized crime criminals and uh, corrupt the politicians and a whole range of other uh, people who do ill to a society. We have also been on the same side of some uh, causes and tonight unfortunately I will have to leave after I make my introduction for a few minutes and then hopefully return for the end of the speech because of a cause that we have worked on jointly. Uh, that is the cause of Soviet dissidents and Soviet Jewry. Rudy Giuliani has been uh, very active and very supportive of the cause of people like Anatoly Sharansky. And tonight Anatoly Sharansky uh, is in another place at Harvard and we're planning a very large demonstration that he will be involved in when Gorbachev comes to Washington uh, in December of this year. So I will have to take my leave and speak to him and meet with him and then come back and hopefully come back in time to hear the answer to my question that I posed just a few minutes ago. But I'm sure you're all in for a great treat. You are going to be listening to one of the great prosecutors of all time, a prosecutor who will clearly go down in the Hall of Fame of prosecution, a prosecutor who poses great problems for civil libertarians because he's so good and he's so tough and he's so honest and he's so popular that nobody ever wants to stand up to him. And the question of who guards the guardians is really a very appropriate one, particularly when you have so honest and tough a prosecutor. And so with nothing further, I want to introduce my sometimes adversary and my always friend, Rudy Giuliani. Thank you very much. And all of that from a Boston Celtic fan. I mean, I, the Yankees are a dynasty, my God. First of all, let me begin by um, thanking Alan for his introduction, and I will answer his questions when we get around to the question and answer session. Seems to me like I've answered them a hundred times, but, um, and I first, I think, uh, given the fact that he's uh, now put, put me under scrutiny as an eventual Supreme Court nominee or other things, I should tell you, that I have a few notes here. Uh, none of this is borrowed or plagiarized from anyone else. <laughs> as far as I know. 
And if it does bear some resemblance to things you've heard other people say in the past, it's because the language has a limited number of words and combinations of words. There are times in which um, I'm uh, compared uh, to other prosecutors, this Hall of Fame of prosecutors, and one of the people that I'm compared to sometimes is someone named Tom Dewey. Now, I mentioned this a few days ago to a group of students in a college, and they looked at me like, who is Tom Dewey, or who was he? Well, Tom Dewey was uh, formerly a chief assistant United States attorney and a district attorney in New York who prosecuted a large number of organized criminals and, um, and uh, corrupt politicians, and then went on to be governor and to run for president unsuccessfully twice. And because I get compared to him and other prosecutors all the time, I've, I tried to find some jokes to say about Tom Dewey. Now, I did research on that, and that's tougher than most legal questions that you will ever research. But I have found one joke, and I want to I see if it's funny. We're going to test it out. Uh, in 1948, on the, on the evening of the election returns of 1948, Tom Dewey was having dinner with his wife before they were going to join their friends and watch the returns. And at the conclusion of dinner, he leaned over to her and he said, Mrs. Dewey, which is what he called her, which may be why it's hard to find anything funny about him, but he <laughs> leaned over to her and he said, Mrs. Dewey, do you realize that tomorrow evening you will be sleeping with the next president of the United States? Isn't that exciting? And she looked at him and said, yes, Tom. They then went down and watched the election returns that's what, that's what it says. She said, yes, Tom. And, and they went down to watch the election returns. And uh, at the end of the evening, it was quite clear to all of them that he'd be the next president of the United States. There was even a, a headline in the Chicago Tribune that read, Dewey defeats Truman. They went to sleep that evening. The next morning, they were awakened by a knock on the door in their hotel room. And a woman came in with breakfast and handed her the newspaper first. It made it quite clear that Truman had defeated Dewey. She awakened him, waited for his eyes to open, showed him the newspaper. Of course, he looked shocked. And before he could say anything or do anything, displaying a terrific sense of humor, she said to him, should I call Harry Truman or should I wait for Harry Truman to call me? <laughs> My wife says that I don't uh, smile enough. That's why I try to tell a joke when I'm on television or whenever I'm being interviewed and she sees me, uh, I come back home and she says, well, you, you just don't smile enough. People don't think you have a sense of humor. You look kind of mean and sour all the time. So I've been working on it. Um, <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe I could try something like the next time we arrest uh, a large number of uh, mafia drug dealers, I could say, today we arrested 12 alleged uh, members of the such and such crime family for selling drugs. Or, or, actually, I don't think what I have uh, to talk about uh, very often lends, I just don't have the material to do that kind of thing. <laughs> I thought what I would try to do to the extent that I can discipline myself enough to do it is to talk briefly and then to have you ask me questions about the things that I'm raising or the things that are on your mind. There is no doubt that the problems of crime in America are something that concern a lot of people and concern people all over the country, and I get to deal with some, not all of those problems. And I think Professor Dershowitz uh, made a very important point uh, during the introduction, uh, because I think it is true that we are beginning to get, although I don't think it's, we've quite arrived there, we're beginning to get a much more balanced picture in the mid to late 1980s of crime in America than we used to get. Uh, not quite proportionate, but considerably more balanced, as between the crime that occurs at the lower socioeconomic levels of our society and the crime that occurs at the upper uh, socioeconomic levels of our society. Uh, the pro disproportion uh, of 10, 15, 20, and 30 years ago uh, was much greater than it is today. The topic for my lecture uh, in the invitation that was sent to me was to talk about organized crime, political corruption, and insider trading. And now they, have, they don't have a lot in common, and then they do have some things in common. And it seems to me that the thing that they probably have most in common is that these are all crimes that are largely committed by very powerful and usually very rich people. And if they're not rich, they're rich in political power. 
We didn't find out an awful lot about those three categories, uh, crime committed by the wealthy or crime committed by the politically powerful or crime committed by the upper levels of organized crime in the past. We would sporadically find out about it. A prosecution of a major leader of organized crime might happen once a decade and be a matter of major national, sometimes even international um, news, the prosecution of Al Capone. I mean, he was one of maybe 50 or 60 people uh, at his level of organized crime at the time that he was prosecuted. He was the only one prosecuted and he, and he was convicted of income tax evasion and not of any of the real underlying crimes that he uh, committed. Uh, and the same thing could be said about political corruption and fraud and uh, crime involved at the upper levels of, of business. Let me see if I can briefly talk about each one of those three areas and give some observations about each, trying to connect them together to some extent, uh, and maybe give you some ideas of where I think we've been doing. By we, I mean the Justice Department a good job and where I think we haven't been doing such a good job, what our successes are and where there are areas where a lot more work has to be done. I think in the area of organized crime, we've done a very effective job in the last four or five years, a much more effective job than has ever been done in the history of the United States. And I think the reason for that is that we finally woke up to the notion that there has to be a national commitment to deal with the problem of organized crime, that it cannot be dealt with sporadically in one locality or another locality or another, that you have to deal with it from a national point of view. To a very large extent, organized crime in our society, and you can look at this historically or you can look at it today, is a function of the immigrant experience in the United States. And what happened simply is that in the 1920s and the 1930s, one organization among many kept getting more and more powerful and kept organizing and growing and growing from first a group of street gangs to uh, citywide, statewide, eventually with a national and even an international structure. It would be interesting, although neither one of these two sets of, of uh, books are particularly well written, but it would be interesting to take Joe Bonanno's biography uh, in which he explains his life and put it next to a biography of J. Edgar Hoover. And the reason it would be interesting is if you chronologically trace uh, the development of the mafia that Joe Bonanno lays out quite accurately uh, all through the 1920s and then the establishment of a commission in the 1930s and the way in which they began, began to develop international connections and, uh, by the 1940s and 1950s. If you were to trace what J. Edgar Hoover was saying and doing about organized crime during that period, it's fascinating what he was saying and doing about it was nothing. He was saying that there was no such thing as organized crime, that it was a myth, and that it was made up by eventually people like Senator Key Fowler and Robert Kennedy and others for their own political aggrandizement. All during that period, the Mafia grew from isolated street gangs to much larger families that had a corporate structure and then the structure of a cartel. That permitted them to do things that individual criminals operating all by themselves cannot achieve. That's the reason why they acquired what I like to call, because it kind of uh, visualizes what we have to accomplish, that's how they acquired institutional power above and beyond the kind of power that any group of hoodlums or criminals have in a particular area. That's how they were able to exercise power over businesses, industries, labor unions, and uh, sometimes uh, politics, the selection of judges, the uh, selection of uh, candidates for public office, because they were permitted to grow into a very powerful, well-organized structure with a lot of money, a lot of property, and a lot of influence, so that when you convicted one, or two, or three, or four, or five, it really didn't mean very much because the empire was just taken over by whomever else was left back out there on the street. The reason why we now are making uh, progress against that old organized crime group and the 25 or 30 other groups that uh, are either uh, fully grown or emerging and moving into various areas, in some cases being uh, abandoned by the Mafia is because uh, Congress finally recognized the enterprise structure of an organized crime group with the passage of the racketeering statute in the late 1960s based very largely on the uh, Valachi uh, hearings and the hearings conducted by Senator McClellan and Attorney General Kennedy in the early 1960s. 
uh, recognize the enterprise structure of organized crime, that you can't deal with organized crime the way you might deal with individual criminals. They present different dangers to society, and you have to recognize the fact that organized crime is an enterprise, um, and that in, in addition to penalties that fit the uh, crimes committed, there, have to be, there has to be the ability to forfeit property, there has to be the ability to take back from organized crime uh, the institution that lives after they're going to prison which is the property that they own, the businesses that they control, the money that they have, because otherwise somebody else is just going to come along and take it over. One of the things that I usually try to point out to make this point is that there is one particular crime family in uh, New York City called the Genovese crime family. It's been around, if you believe Bonanno's book and the FBI reports and everything else, since about 1910 and continuously from 1910 until at least two or three years ago, in each succeeding era, it has grown in power, influence, money, uh, more businesses, more labor unions, uh, and considerably more power politically in each succeeding decade. You could easily say that law enforcement has been quite successful in convicting the head of the, or of the Genovese crime family, because from 1930 until 19, the mid-1980s, we have been successful in consistently convicting the head of the family and sending them off to prison for four years or five years or 10 or 15, and a few even died on their way to prison. However, the family got bigger and bigger, more and more powerful, because what we never did was to dismantle the structure of the Genovese crime family. We didn't take away its money. We didn't take away its businesses. We didn't take away the power that lives after, the instrumentalities through which they extort money from people, they intimidate people, they bribe public officials, and that sort of thing. And what we have been doing in the last three or four years, in addition to just prosecuting people and putting them in prison, which is important, particularly for the crimes they actually committed rather than for, for some technical violation of the law, what we've been doing is bringing both criminal, using criminal forfeiture proceedings and civil racketeering, uh, st the civil racketeering statute to try and take the institutional power back from organized crime. And that, that is precisely what has to be done with all of the new organized crime groups that are coming along. Uh, we call them newly emerging organized crime groups. It really is a misnomer because many of them already, already emerged. And although the mafia gets the most attention because it's kind of a trademark, these newer groups are often, if not as powerful, certainly as violent and pre present as much, if not more, of a danger for the future. And the lesson that the federal government learned from the mistakes of the 30s, 40s, and 50s, when many people in the federal government were saying there is no organized crime, is that we, will, we are not doing that with the new groups that are coming along. We are investigating them, prosecuting them, and revealing them at early, earlier stages of development so they don't grow into the gigantic problem that the mafia became. That, I think, is a fairly successful picture. It does not mean that there, is no, there will be no organized crime in the future. It doesn't mean that it's all going to be dismantled in a few days or a few months or a few years. But the federal government is doing now what it should have been doing 30 or 40 years ago, both with regard to the old groups and the new groups, and moving precisely in the right direction. And it should keep it up. I think the same thing is true generally uh, in the white collar crime area. In each year since the mid-1970s, there has been a substantial, or at least an increase, at times a substantial increase, in the amount of emphasis on white-collar crime within the Department of Justice. And by white-collar crime, you really have to define that uh, broadly, because I don't know any other, way to, any other way to define it. It largely means crimes committed by businessmen. It also, in my view, involves crimes committed by public officials, particularly in taking bribes. Each, in each one of those areas, tax evasion, fraud, securities fraud, political corruption, in each succeeding year, whether it was the Ford administration or the Carter administration or the Reagan administration, you see substantial increases in the number of people prosecuted and the level of the people prosecuted for um, various kinds of white collar crime. It's something that we did not devote enough resources to in the past, and it's something that we're not presently devoting enough resources to, and we have to continue uh, to do that. And we have to continue to do it for a number of reasons, not the least of which is that the long-term damage inflicted on our society by white-collar criminals, particularly at the upper levels, is equally as devastating, 
if not maybe in a somewhat more abstract way, as devastating as the damage done by violent criminals and drug dealers. Because it does something that is very, very, um, very difficult to describe, but you all um, understand it, I think, when I try to describe it. It basically unhinges the respect for law that every other citizen has when they find out that people at the upper levels of society, people with all of the advantages and all of the ability to internalize voluntary respect for the rule of law, uh, do not do that when they're presented with uh, particularly the temptation to make huge amounts of money. The United States government, the federal government, is the only law enforcement institution, if not the only, it's certainly uh, is almost the only law enforcement institution that is capable of taking on those kinds of uh, criminal investigations and criminal prosecutions. It largely cannot be done at a local level. The resources aren't there. The concentration on various forms of violent crime and drug crime is too great because the immediate problems, the emergency problems, are mostly in that area. And very often, the kind of jurisdiction isn't available. Uh, many of the things that we do, we're able to do because we can subpoena people all over the country. A local prosecutor can't do that. Many of the things we, we can do, we, we do because we have the ability to deal with the FBI or the Drug Enforcement Administration all over the world. And if we have to make a request for records in Switzerland or records in Bolivia or uh, in all the various ways in which money is laundered, we can do that. So what I'm saying is that if the federal government doesn't do it, it largely cannot be done. And therefore, the concentration on white-collar crime has to continue. I think it will, because I believe it's been institutionalized, but it has to continue. And there's a, there is a connection, in my view, as to at least one of, and, and whether you're talking about violent crime or organized crime or white-collar crime, insider trading, whatever, there are numerous, obviously, reasons and causes, and it's a very complex phenomenon. But in my view, there is one a similar thing that the federal government did incorrectly about the whole area, particularly of securities fraud and insider trading, with regard to that as it did with organized crime. And one statistic alone, I think, might, might describe it. The United States Congress made it a crime over 50 years ago to trade on inside information. From the day that it became a crime, 1933, until 1984. 12 people had been criminally prosecuted under that statute. 12 people had been convicted, prosecuted and convicted under that statute. Most of them in the last decade uh, of the statute. From that date, from January 1, 1984 until today, 50 people have been convicted of insider trading. Not accused, not under investigation, not uh, uh, possibly involved, and the allegations have to be worked out one way or the other as to whether they're true or false. Over 50 people have been convicted of the crime of insider trading. That's 12 in 50 years and then 50 in three years. I'm not saying that because our record is so terrific. I mean, that's what we should, we should be doing. We probably should have convicted more. I mean, we probably should have taken on more cases and done more, and I wish we had the resources to do it. I'm making the point because, to a very large extent, one of the prime uh, uh, factors that was placed there by the United States Congress to discourage insider trading, to make the market appear fairer, be fairer, and to deal with um, what is essentially cheating, uh, wasn't operating. Congress passed it, it was put there for good reason, and it was never used. So that when people came into the 1980s, uh, subjected to the tremendous temptations that uh, not only uh, uh, the dollars gave them, but the various takeovers and the ways in which you could now trade on inside information with less scrutiny and less risk. There was, there was not present what Congress assumed was present, which is a deterrent. The deterrent that at least a certain number of people, proportionate number of people, were being caught and punished for committing this particular crime. In fact, it would not have been uh, an incorrect assumption to make in the early 1980s the statistical chance that you would be caught and punished for insider trading was almost non-existent, if non-existent, since only 12 people had been prosecuted in 50 years. The federal government did very similar things with organized crime during that very period, which is to ignore the existence of the, of the problem. And I think in both cases, they built a problem that could have been dealt with much more easily at a lower level into a gigantic problem. The investigations 
in the insider trading area and the area of financial fraud have been very successful in the way in which I measure success, much the same way as organized crime, which is, I think, creating a social phenomenon, at least decreasing the power of organized crime. The insider trading and financial fraud investigations have moved the Congress of the United States to consider some changes, major changes, and it has moved a number of the financial institutions to begin focusing on auditing programs, internal investigations, new rules for trading. Some firms publicly admit it, some don't, because they think to do so will admit that they had a problem in the past. But it has largely changed a lot of the agenda for both the Congress and for financial institutions, all in a positive direction, to the extent of trying uh, to avoid this problem in the future. Now, let me give you two areas very quickly before I get to your questions where I don't think we've had that kind of success. And the number of prosecutions and the number of convictions and the rate of conviction is just as great, probably greater, in these two other areas. But the point I'm trying to make is that that isn't the way I think the work of a um, United States attorney or a prosecutor's office should be, be viewed. The reason I think we're having less success in these two other areas is that there isn't as much movement and there isn't as much change in the other parts of society uh, so that you don't have to be dealing with these problems as problems where people have to be investigated, arrested, prosecuted, and put in prison. One area is the area of tax evasion, which gets much too little attention uh, in our society, whereas insider trading has gotten a great deal of attention. When I became United States Attorney in 1983, there was a case that was under investigation in my office called the Mark Rich case. And the case involved about $90 million in alleged uh, uh, and alleged taxes that had not been paid to the federal government. To me, as a former assistant United States attorney, that was a huge, I had never, a huge amount of money. I had never heard of a tax evasion case uh, of that dimension. Two years, three years, allegedly $90 million in taxes not paid. And I had done a lot of tax cases as an assistant, a million dollars, two million dollars. We handled the case. Mr. Rich became a fugitive, but we prosecuted his companies and settled the case eventually uh, for penalties and racketeering penalties of about $200 million and got back for the federal government what uh, had been, the government had been deprived of. And I thought that was the biggest tax evasion case I would ever see. That was quickly followed by a $150 million tax evasion case and then a $400 million tax evasion case now fully prosecuted and affirmed on appeal and the defendant is serving a 15-year prison sentence. So I can talk about that pretty in detail, because it's an established fact, not an allegation. And, and, then, and then we've had investigations now that are approaching a billion dollars in tax evasion. We do more tax evasion work than we do inside a trading work, I believe, although it's very close. And the amounts of money are gigantic. And it says to me that, uh, that if Americans paid the taxes that they legally owed the government, and if they stopped criminally avoid evading their taxes as opposed to uh, various forms of, uh, of, of, of avoidance that might be, you might morally argue about but aren't, aren't crimes, I don't think that we would have the deficit problem that we have because I think the levels that I've seen of tax evasion are so great at so many different, at, at, in so many different circumstances that we're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars, not, um, not just insignificant amounts of money. And what that says to me is that we've done a very poor job of uh, in incorporating into people voluntary respect for the rule of law. And unfortunately, we have to get their attention by prosecuting, convicting, and trying to seek prison terms like the prison term that this one particular individual received of 15 years to convince them to do what they should know how to do and learn how to do at a much earlier stage. Similarly, I think our problem of political corruption in this country is one where uh, we have not been able to create the kind of changes that give me or you any assurance that, uh, this, that what is sometimes called a cyclical pattern of corruption just isn't going to uh, uh, recur in the future. I don't believe there are cyclical patterns of corruption. What I believe, I don't just believe, I'm sure I know, is that there is a consistent ongoing historical patterns of corruption and what happens is that due to uh, opportunity or, or a combination of opportunity and hard work and concentration on a particular area, at various times we just find out more of what's wrong with us than we do at other times. 
but what we have but what we have never done and particularly I can talk somewhat authoritatively of my own state New York is we have never done the things that have to be done to change uh, those patterns we haven't made the very tough changes that have to be made so that although we, we would, even if we made them we wouldn't eliminate all corruption there'd still be corruption at least we could begin to cut into it and reduce it and turn it around we have had not only in my own office but uh, all throughout the state of New York and then in, you could go pick another 10 states just and at the federal state and local level one example after another of public officials not involved in marginal forms of um, of misbehavior or unethical behavior but people who have been convicted of taking bribes and offering bribes and um, and we have not yet seen the kinds of changes that are needed to discourage that behavior the kinds of things that it suggests about conflict of interest laws and uh, campaign financing and all of the things that could be done to not make a situation perfect we never will do that but at least to react sensibly and logically to the abuses uh, that we've seen and in those two areas I think unfortunately uh, there, are, there are going to have to be there's going to have to be continued emphasis a con continued emphasis in, in investigations and prosecutions and examples of um, of this kind of misbehavior and criminal behavior presented to the public so that we eventually create a climate so that those changes that are sensible and logical and that are the law in some place or another where they have more sensibly dealt with the problem those things are done there is also one other thing that has to happen and I'm not sure I know I'm sure I don't know how to make it happen but I know it's a problem and it, in a way it's an, it's, a, it's an illogical problem every single time uh, we indict someone or convict someone uh, who is in public office whether it's at the lowest level or the highest level I know that in a subtle maybe not so subtle way we are convincing people or alienating people from government we are saying to young people in particular for some reason the reaction is that this is not a place where I want to be I don't want to be involved in politics I don't want to be involved in government um, it has an alienation kind of an effect it creates cynicism distrust of public officials in fact it should probably create just the opposite uh, reaction it should create the reaction that after all this is a democracy and you can take it over and run it uh, more people should want to get involved rather than having election uh, uh, participation decrease with uh, revelations of corruption we should see huge increases in the participation in an election and the participation in politics and the participation in government so that people who are honest and straight take over and deal with uh, and and begin dealing with these problems and I think we by we now I mean broadly speaking leaders in government and do not do a good job of explaining that to people the single most um, encouraging thing that happened to me as United States Attorney was about six months ago a group of priests ministers and rabbis from the South Bronx who had invested a, who were who uh, who wanted to uh, uh, get people interested in setting standards for public officials got together put a lot of money into educational programs for the citizens of the South Bronx because there are so many of them that don't participate who are discouraged and alienated by the fact that their political system is being run by people who are in essence um, uh, people who don't live there don't care about it and are making huge amounts of money whether the whether some of those are people who have been convicted or some of those are those involved in ethical behavior they're making huge amounts of money uh, off this political system and what they decided to do was to bring people into the political system and to hold public officials accountable for whether or not they're helping with problems like housing and crime and whatever the problems of a particular neighborhood rather than just holding a public office and then taking down a hundred thousand to a million dollars in consulting fees from businesses who want to do business in that area uh, they can do that I mean they can actually accomplish that they just a lot of people don't know they can accomplish that and those ministers priests and rabbis are doing something that government officials are not doing a particularly good job of which is to take all of these examples and exhort people to get involved in government and to take it back 
rather than to look at it and throw their hands up in frustration and say, nothing can be done. Well, there are a bunch of other points that I would like to make. Um, let me just close with two very, uh, very briefly, because I think long term, uh, the answer to most of the problems that I've been talking about is in the political and educational areas, not in what in in uh, investigating and prosecuting people. Uh, hopefully, by investigating and prosecuting people in these areas, you uh, show people in in a certain way what's wrong with our society. But the solutions don't exist uh, through investigating, prosecuting, and sending people off to prison. They exist in motivating people to get involved in politics, motivating people to get involved in government to try to straighten out these problems at an earlier stage. And maybe they illustrate sometimes some of the lacks in our educational system and in the other structures in our society that aren't working as well. The case that probably troubled me the most not on a personal basis, but more on an institutional level. It was a case involving four young people who had graduated from law school or from business school within two years of the day that we arrested them for being involved in, a, in an insider trading scheme and a fraud scheme. Uh, I believe they were either in their late 20s or very early 30s. And the reason it troubled me the most was that my conception of that kind of crime was that it occurred somewhere after 20 10, 15, 20 years in the business world or in the legal world and you become cynical and lots of pressures and lots of difficulties and your standards and values break down and all of a sudden money becomes the only object and you cheat and you cheat others and, uh, and take money from them. Unfortunately, just at that very time I was going to give a commencement address at the institution where one of them had graduated from and it began getting me to think that we do not do a particularly good job in American education of training young people in ethics. In fact, we don't, really. Uh, we have lately, at least, been discussing in much more detail uh, more formal training in ethics in law schools and business schools and professional schools, but really that's too late. I think it's important, and I think it's valuable, and I think it's better than nothing at all. But training a person in college or law school or medical school or business school in ethics uh, who has never had any training in ethics before uh, is just not going to work as effectively as we want it to work. And we really have to begin teaching young people ethics and exposing them to ethics at a much earlier age, at 6 and 7 and 8 and 9 and 10 in the grammar schools. We have to divorce the notion of teaching religion from teaching ethics. The two things are very different. And we have to remember, I think, that this is not by any means a novel suggestion. The Greeks did it thousands of years ago and saw it as the bedrock of a democracy. Socrates was walking around Athens discussing ethics with the young people of Athens. And part of a classic Greek education required as one of the four primary subjects for a young person to learn ethics. And it is really the bedrock of a democracy. It is more important than any of the other things that people learn because a democracy only works if people broadly, voluntarily respect the rule of law. They understand the reasons why they have to obey the law. And then only a very, very small minority have to be dealt with by the exercise of force, which is what the criminal justice system is all about. And only a very small group uh, have to be dealt with in that way and persuaded through that means. I'm going to stop because there are five more things that I want to say, but I want to take your questions, and uh, why don't we start with that? Yes. If your political ambitions parallel, all right. I guess, I guess uh, they parallel his ambitions uh, in terms of victories and don't in terms of losses. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, I, uh, since Tom Dewey, every person that held my office 
that ran for public office has been uh, uh, defeated horribly at the polls. So I don't know that there's any other good example. I don't know what my my ambitions are. I mean, I I don't. Um, I've now over, I've now spent four years and almost a half as the United States Attorney, which has me as a holdover, and I have to decide uh, what I want to do with the rest of my life. And I don't know yet. I mean, I don't know whether uh, I want to run for office uh, or I don't. There are a lot of things about it that are very intriguing and very fulfilling, and there are a lot of things about it that are very um, uh, unnerving and difficult to deal with, particularly insofar as your personal life is concerned. So I don't know what my, uh, what my decision was going to be, and if I knew it, I would, I would tell you. Uh, I do think that public service, for me, is a very exciting way to live my life. It makes me feel, very com it makes me feel better about myself. I've been in private practice for four years, and I've been in public service for the rest of my career, and I enjoyed private practice immensely and wouldn't mind a little more time there resting and relaxing. That might give you some idea of the difference in the value judgment that I place on public service and private practice. So I know that even if I leave my job, don't run for office, and practice law privately, at some point I'm going to want to come back into government. Uh, but I don't know yet when or how or what would be the appropriate way to do it. Uh, which requires, for example, selecting a sportsman, which is like, rather uh, following the area of environmental law, well, I was not familiar with, we have what I would consider. Well, I think the point that, that you make is a very good one and, go, and it's a lot broader than just environmental, environmental laws. Uh, part, of it stems, I, uh, part of it stems from the fact that we, that we have um, such a great deal of crime to deal with in our society. I can't compare, nobody can, the amount of white-collar crime to the amount of white-collar crime in other democracies. But if you compare the amount of violent crime as some barometer of just the total level of crime in a society, and I think it actually isn't such a bad barometer of the total amount of crime in a society, Americans murder each other approximately 10 times more than Englishmen and 20 times more than Japanese. And we commit other viola physical violations of each other at rates roughly comparable to that if we were to compare ourselves to France, Italy, Israel, Japan, you name the society. And I don't know that the rates of um, fraud and uh, political corruption or whatever are as great as that, but, but we have problems in all those areas as well. So we have a great deal of crime to deal with. We have a very large, heterogeneous country. Uh, we've made certain decisions about how much money we want to invest in the criminal justice system, not only on a federal level, but state and local political decisions. Uh, so that w what I'm saying is that we, we are stuck with some form of selective enforcement and prosecution by example. Now, you... Well, Well, if you're going to trip, if, if okay, if you're going to trip and hurt somebody, maybe you should tie both your shoes. I don't know. Uh, um, oh, 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 no, no, no. Then, then we, then we, uh, we dramatically disagree with each other. I don't think we have a lot of white collar crime. I, m most of the people that I can recall sending off to prison weren't sitting around deciding whether they were going to cheat somebody for 10 more million dollars because the laws were irrational. I and mean, the vast majority of people that I can think of, if not all, uh, that we've sent off pr to prison for white collar crimes were doing it for a very different reason than the irrationality of the laws. They were doing it for money.
in that case. <laughs> That'll give you an idea. I didn't know that. Actually, there's something, there's something on the brochure for this uh, lecture that says that uh, uh, security will be provided. There really is. I noticed it coming up on the plane. I don't know. Maybe you're trying to tell me something. The, uh, did everybody hear the question? There, is, there really is no uh, danger that I'm in, uh, any kind of general danger that I'm in that's any greater than the danger that uh, uh, lots of people are in who, who uh, are involved in law enforcement or involved in other areas, and I'll tell you why. The, uh, the, the reason you ask that question mostly comes from the investigations and prosecutions of organized crime figures. It doesn't come from the uh, insider traders and the po corrupt politicians. So they're not going to come and shoot me. Uh, and unless they're crazy and that nobody can protect against that. Organized crime groups in the United States do not attack government officials. They don't attack police officers and they don't attack agents and they don't attack prosecutors. That's a rule that they have and it's the only rule they have that I agree with. And I endorse it. <laughs> I am, the danger that I, that I, the danger that I face is the danger of something irrational happening. And uh, unfortunately, you can't do a job in America or the world without facing that danger. So far, so far, uh, the one rule that I heartily endorse, they all follow. Uh, and there are irrational people, and that's the risk that I face or my assistants do or the agents face. And we have had threats, and we had to, have had to, I've had to have protection at times, and the and assistant U.S. attorneys have had to have protection. But almost always it comes from places that you don't expect, not from uh, the actual organized crime groups. They, are, they recognize that that is an irrational thing and that it's more harmful to them uh, to be engaged in that than not harmful to their business. Irrational people, emotionally disturbed people, don't recognize that. Uh, or maybe people, if, if, if uh, America ever had the uh, problem of terrorism that some other societies have had, then it, it might be a different story, but thank God up to this point, we haven't had that problem. <laughs> yes, sir. Which, which one? Uh, I didn't see 60 Minutes Left. Do you remember which prison it was? I know the prison system. Eglin, okay. I, I know Eglin uh, very well. Uh, <laughs> some of my best friends are there. Uh, uh, prisons are, I, I think prison is necessary for serious white collar offenders uh, for a lot of reasons. Not the least of which is that um, the only way you're going to deter some forms of white collar crime, bribery, uh, tax evasion, crimes where there's a tremendous profit motive for committing the crime if the risk of getting caught and the risk of punishment isn't, isn't there, isn't a real uh, threat, you need to follow through with uh, prison sentences. And I think you also have to, one of the purposes of punishment in any criminal context is vindication uh, for the for the public. And when a person violates their oath of office in a serious way, you know, in, a, in a felonious way, um, then mo more often than not, it should be followed up with a prison term. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen. Unfortunately, what happens is, I, I think these statistics are still correct, they were when I was Associate Attorney General, no better than about a third of the people convicted of white collar crime actually sees the inside of a prison, which is a mistake. It should be more like two thirds. Um, I don't believe in general rules about going to prison. I, mean, I don't think, I think it would be demagoguery to say every single white collar offender should go to prison any more than you should say that every violent offender or every person involved in drug crime should go to prison because I've seen too many exceptions where anybody, even the person who says that uh, in, in uh, the most general terms would make an exception given health, given family, given sometimes very, very extenuating circumstances. But, but the percentages have to change. A larger percentage should go to prison than presently do, and they should go to prison for somewhat more time, speaking generally, than they do. 
I think that you have to have uh, various forms of prisons available for people. Uh, I think the thing that's wrong, I think the federal prison system is a very good prison system. I think the state prison systems, not all, but a lot, are inhumane, horrible places to put people. And, and, that, and the, the federal prison that is the most secure in Marion, which is a prison that takes on the worst not only of federal offenders but of state offenders who can't be controlled in a state prison is a lot more humane and decent a place than state prisons that hold people of much less um, potential for violence. The federal prison system is run on a, on a different kind of a theory. The theory of it is that the punishment is the deprivation of liberty. Thereafter, the amount of confinement uh, required should only be in order to control your behavior. And if you can demonstrate that you don't need any more confinement than uh, within the perimeters of that particular facility, then no more is going to be imposed on you. And it's a very sensible way to run a prison system, and it's the reason why there is just enormously less violence in federal prison than in a state prison. It can always get better or worse. It's not a penitentiary model prison. That uh, prison that you saw, Eglin, is not only the place where certain white-collar offenders go, it's the place where drug dealers and violent criminals go uh, as they're moving their way out of prison after they've demonstrated that they can deal with prison without being violent, without creating problems. Um, it is not just white-collar offenders in the so-called prison camps. It's anybody who has displayed over a long enough period of time, depending on the behavior for which they're in prison, that they can be uh, controlled and act responsibly within prison. It also allows for a place to put people as they're moving on their way out of prison. So you can see how they're going to deal with less onerous conditions of confinement. And despite uh, 60 Minutes description of it, the wonderful conditions in federal prison, uh, nobody has ever voluntarily asked for admission to a federal prison. Uh, usually they spend hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars trying to prevent us from putting them there, even the so-called prison camps. Um, and I think it's a m much more logical, sensible prison system and it does apply equally as between white-collar offenders and non-white-collar offenders within the federal prison system. But then when you compare the federal prison system to a lot of state prison systems, it really is a very unfair situation. And what should happen is the state prison systems should change, not the federal prison system. Yes, sir. That's a long question. Uh, the, uh, oh, oh, okay, right. The, uh, I have to uh, remember the public record so that I stick to it, uh, <laughs> since that's a pending investigation. But uh, I think all of this is a matter of public record. The uh, insider trading investigations, in a broad sense, uh, are installed, although there is an impediment, which is now public because of, it's been... Um, at least been put on the record in one particular civil case, and that is that any further insider trading um, indictments or trials are on hold until the Supreme Court decides the Carpenter case. Uh, since uh, the misappropriation theory is at the core of most of the cases, uh, and, the inside, and the misappropriation theory may or may not be uh, just completely rejected or modified, it would really be impossible, or at least it would, wouldn't be prudent to indict somebody now and, tr and go to trial on a theory that may turn out to be not the law or some new theory that a judge should charge a jury, unless there is really a pressing reason to do so, like a statute of limitations is running, 
or where you can prosecute the case for something other than, for some other crime other than insider trading. Uh, so we have agreed to hold certain cases where there have been indictments, and we would not go forward with an indictment unless uh, there was some other reason for doing it. Uh, beyond that, I can't discuss whether or not the investigation is stalled in terms of what's going on in the grand jury. I can't, I mean, I'm not allowed to discuss that. Uh, I can tell you what happened with the case because this is all a matter of public record. Uh, they were charged, those three defendants were charged with um, basically two areas of insider trading. Uh, the investigation then revealed seven other areas. Uh, and the government made the decision that we could not go forward with those two because if we did so, we would take the risk that we would create a double jeopardy effect since there was also a conspiracy count in the indictment. We would create a double jeopardy effect so that whether they were convicted or acquitted of the two transactions, uh, there'd be a good argument that we might not be able to prosecute them for the other seven. Also, we thought it didn't make sense to prosecute the case with only two out of nine uh, transactions, that it made sense to put all of them together. We, uh, the case was only two months old at the time, which is a relatively short period of time for a federal case of that uh, complexity, and we asked for a continuance in order, and we were within the Speedy Trial Act at the time, in order to get a further indictment, or to ask the grand jury to return a further indictment, including all of the transactions. The judge refused to allow us the continuance, but said that you could dismiss the indictment and then take all the time that you wanted to put in whatever it is that you wanted to put in to investigate what you wanted to investigate. And uh, that's the option that we took. The defense tried to stop that and tried to have that dismissal with prejudice, and the judge refused to do that. Um, if, in fact, in maybe 10 other cases that I could point to you, a judge hadn't given us the time where the facts suggested an expanded investigation was required to do that, we would have done precisely the same thing. But in the other nine or 10 situations, including the insider trading area, judges had given us that time. Um, so I think we made the same decision that we w would have made you know, on, on neutral principles in a lot of other cases. The reason for the handcuffs. Federal agencies have a rule that is a rule without um, variation. That at the time of an arrest, when you get into the vehicle, it's going to take you to the FBI headquarters or the postal headquarters or the drug enforcement headquarters, you, you must be handcuffed. And the reason they have that rule is to protect their agents, not so much as against physical violence, but as against the possibility of an irrational, emotional kind of thing happening. And therefore, uh, somebody gets into the vehicle and uh, begins to get very emotional and starts swinging his arms or tries to run away, and all of a sudden, uh, somebody's going to get hit over the head or shot. Uh, an arrest situation is an inherently emotional situation. And sure, in situations with violent criminals, there's more of a chance of that happening. But each one of those agencies can cite to you examples of people arrested for fraud, people arrested for tax evasion. A marshal was murdered a couple of years ago in an arrest for tax evasion for a very simple reason. It is an enormously emotional experience. Most people react rationally during an emotional experience. Some don't. And then things get very confused at the time of an arrest, and agents don't take um, you know, running or pushing or, I mean, they react strongly to that. And you're all of a sudden going to have a disproportionate incident. So they have this rule. Uh, it's not my rule. I make the decision whether an arrest is required or not, or my assistants do. We authorize it. They then apply this rule. And I believe it's a good rule. So I'm not running away from it, but I'm telling you how the decision is made. In uh, uh, those defendants, Two were handcuffed as they got into the vehicle with no embarrassment to them at all. And that's the rule. They were handcuffed. They were put in the vehicle. One defendant, when they arrived to arrest him, refused to go with him, go with them. He said, I'm not going to go. And you just don't say that to agents who have a warrant for your arrest. <laughs> they react. They reacted to him the way they reacted to the thousand other people that they have arrested. Uh, they were postal agents. So they, a lot of, the, a lot of them arrested uh, people for... You know, $100 theft from the mail or $25 theft from the mail, they put handcuffs on them, and just because he was whatever he was, the same rule applied to him that applied to anybody else. You say you don't come along, put out your hands, there's your handcuffs. Um, when people voluntarily surrender, 
to us or to the FBI, we do not put handcuffs on them. Many state, in many state jurisdictions, including uh, New York until recently, they put handcuffs on them. And then some of the exaggerated things that were said about that incident just aren't true. I mean, it was not done for publicity. There are no pictures of it, although people have written that, that it was done in order to publicize their arrest. There were no cameras there. There was no advance notice of it. No one put any emphasis on the fact that they were handcuffed. Uh, it just happens to be the rule. And I, and I, if I were running the postal authorities or the FBI or whatever, I would, I would enforce the same rule. And I would not want to sensationalize it. And I think it's a mistake to, to uh, photograph people with handcuffs on and unnecessarily embarrass them. But I think given what an arrest situation is like, the rule, the rule is logical. It makes sense. Yes, sir. I'm investigating. I'm investigating Wetter. You know that. Okay. Okay. What do I do to change the attitude and the example that I'm setting or the, that, they, that they are setting? Um, I don't, I mean, I, I think what, I think what, um, what you just asked me is, is polemics, not reality. Um, I mean, that, that's political, that's, that's a fair uh, argument to be made at the Democratic National Convention when people are exhorted to vote for an honest re Democrat as opposed to a Republican and then we'll get uh, all the independent councils that existed during the Carter administration back, uh, and we'll compare them to the independent councils during the Reagan administration. I don't, um, I mean, I, if I were to look back at the four and a quarter years that I've been a United States attorney and look at the people that have been investigated and prosecuted and the ones that have been convicted, uh, I bet this is the case. I bet it's proportionate to the number of Republicans and Democrats roughly in my district. I've seen um, during the WedTech investigation, uh, my office along with the Bronx District Attorney's Office developed the evidence that led to the appointment of an independent counsel with regard to Mr. Nossiger and with regard to Mr. Meese. Mr. Nossiger has been indicted and is about to go to trial, as well as the evidence that led to the indictment of other appointees of President Reagan and then the Democratic Borough President of the Bronx and, um, and an equal list of Democrats. Neither political party has a monopoly on virtue or vice. They have, uh, I think, a proportionate number of honorable, decent, terrific people who are trying to do their jobs, make mistakes, and sometimes the press exaggerates those mistakes into um, things that are much worse than actually occurred. And both political parties have a certain group of people that are, that are absolute out and out crooks. I don't think there's any connection between being in favor of deregulation and being dishonest. I mean, it's a legitimate political view. It's a legitimate view of the economy. You may agree with it or disagree with it. I may agree with it or disagree with it, but there's no connection between, between that and, and that money grubbing. Well, uh, yeah, but what is, I mean, what, um, I know, I mean, I don't want to pick out particular people. They're nice people and uh, honorable people, but there are an awful lot of people who left Democratic administrations and made millions of dollars uh, practicing law, doing lobbying. Uh, the, the Republican lobbyists are no more dishonest or honest than the Democratic lobbyists. And the uh, 
Republican power brokers in Washington are no more honorable or dishonorable than the Democratic power brokers in Washington. And the, and the political philosophy of one political party as opposed to another is no more honest or dishonest. It may be the philosophy you agree with more or the one I agree with more, uh, but there's nothing inherently dishonorable, dishonest, or unethical about the various versions of what you might call the Republican political philosophy, of which there are a number, or the Democratic political philosophy. Both parties, unfortunately, have a certain number of people, and I think too many, that are crooks and that are in politics for the wrong reason. Um, and I think there are things the administration has done that are a tremendous credit to the administration, and there are things that this administration has done that have been a terrible mistake. And that describes, that, that will describe the next administration, whichever, whichever it is, Republican or Democratic. Uh, the question is uh, to comment on the civil provisions of the racketeering statute and whether or not uh, I think they've been abused uh, in recent years in order to threaten people into settlements and that sort of thing. Uh, I th yes, I think they have. And I think that, um, I think I should be a little more precise in the answer though. I don't think it's so much the civil, um, the civil RICO statute as it is the use of the, of the racketeering statute by private plaintiffs, because there's no control over that use. The United States government can either indict somebody under the racketeering statute or can bring a civil RICO case, and we've done both. And, we, and particularly in the organized crime area, we use the civil provisions of the racketeering statute, for example, against businesses where we believe we have proof that they're controlled by organized crime. Uh, and we ask for divestiture of the business, and we ask for the appointment of receivers and trustees to oversee it while that's happening, and we do the same thing with labor unions. However, I cannot do that on my own. In order for me to sign a racketeering indictment or a civil complaint under the racketeering statute, I have to get permission of a centralized body in the Justice Department in the, in the organized crime and racketeering section, and the purpose of the review is to make certain that I'm not using the racketeering statute now I'm speaking of all the United States attorneys, not just me, in a disproportionate way. That I'm not uh, using this tremendous weapon against a little insignificant problem. And I try to do it that way. I mean, I try, that's the way you try to make the decision that you don't use the racketeering statute in all of the situations in which you could conceivably or theoretically use it, but you try to use it for major organized crime prosecutions, major white-collar crime prosecutions, We've used it in the tax evasion area with Mark Rich, and we've used it in the political corruption area with some of the cases that's being used now in the WedTech case. And the, and the standard the Justice Department we have to satisfy is that we're talking about large-scale crime, not um, somebody's involved in a small bribery scheme and there are two mail frauds and therefore you can use, uh, you can use the racketeering statute. Unfortunately, on the civil side, where private plaintiffs are involved, there is no, they're not government officials, they're not accountable. Um, they don't have, there's no way to have a centralized mechanism, so you can, you can apply the statute literally. I mean, if you, have two, if you have two mail frauds, what you can allege are mail frauds, all of a sudden you can now allege a pattern of racketeering. And so I think, it, I think it would make sense for Congress to try to find ways to limit the private use of the racketeering statute so that it can't be used as a system of abuse. You know, allege somebody is a racketeer and then you force them to have to settle with you. I think that does happen and I've seen some abuses like that. And from the point of view of a prosecutor, federal prosecutor, I worry about that because I, what I worry about is the Justice Department has been, has set up this very elaborate process to defend our use of the racketeering statute before Congress. That's re really the reason for it. So that if and when um, people who are very interested in uh, in trying to cut back on the ability of the Justice Department from using the racketeering statute, run into the run to the Senate Judiciary Committee or House Judiciary Committee, we can come in with our record and show uh, we could have used it in 120 situations. We've only used it in 40, 
and the 40 that we used it in are very, you have to agree, are very substantial crimes. We don't have that kind of control over civil plaintiffs. We can't. And I'm afraid that Congress will not be discriminating in the way it, um, the way it amends the racketeering statute. And they'll confuse the abuses of private plaintiffs for abuses by the government. And I would like to see, I'd like to see that uh, dealt with. Think they all disagree with that? I don't know. <laughs> yes, we'll make it. But yes, that um, that used to be a very emotional issue about two years ago. The question is the forfeiture of fees uh, in drug and organized crime cases. It was a very emotional issue two years ago because a lot of people believed that it was going to be overused, used to abuse uh, people, used to interfere with the right to counsel. Uh, and I, don't, I believe the record is that it has not been. It's been used very sparingly. It's been used with discretion. And it's been used in situations where uh, at least there's a good faith basis for believing and therefore alleging and trying to show that the money uh, that has gone into the hands of the lawyers or is intended for the hands of the lawyers is known to be uh, the proceeds of a seriously illegal activity. Uh, that's at least the regulations that the Justice Department imposes on what would be possibly a broader use of the statute. Uh, the question of the constitutionality of all that is something the Supreme Court is going to have to decide and uh, you know, the Justice Department has its arguments and the other side has arguments. But it has not turned into some kind of a gross interference with the right to counsel because it's been used very sparingly and very carefully. Uh, maybe if the Supreme Court upholds it and, and gives some guidance on it, it will be used somewhat more. But the standards are so rigid that it's never going to be used very broadly. It has to be a situation in which the lawyer knows uh, that th the money that he's getting are the proceeds of drug activities or some other kind of very serious form of criminal activity. Well, that's a very, that, 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 that argument used to be made. Suppose your client is named Genovese and therefore you must know, et cetera, et cetera. So that argument was made in a, in a hypothetical way before the statute uh, really has been used. Uh, and what people fail to realize is that in most situations, except maybe um, some unusual uh, drug organizations, uh, most organized criminals, particularly at that level, uh, have both legitimate and illegitimate income. It's a rare member of a sophisticated organized crime group that doesn't have as much, if not more, legitimate income as he has illegitimate income. And all the government can forfeit is his illegitimate income. And it hasn't been a burden, not even a slight burden, on any of the major members of organized crime in paying their lawyers because all of them are structured in such a way that they have a tremendous amount of legal uh, income. Now, I should answer Professor Dershowitz's question because he'll get real upset if I don't. And the question, if you remember, was, uh, since we can catch all these other people, why can't we catch uh, leakers, uh, people who leak information about criminal uh, investigations or, most seriously of all, leak the uh, point that he made was Bess Meyerson's taking the Fifth Amendment, because that's really the most serious form of a leak on the part of a prosecutor, leaking uh, information from a grand jury, in particular information that will defame someone uh, and from my point of view, nothing is more serious than leaking the invocation of the Fifth Amendment because people should have confidence that when they say something in a grand jury, it will remain sealed forever for all, for all sorts of reasons, not the least of which is we wouldn't get some of our testimony uh, if people didn't have that sense of confidence. The reason it's difficult to catch leakers is you can usually get it to within three or four people. Uh, you can't get it precisely. And uh, there's another countervailing consideration. Uh, and that is, you have to go to the reporter and force the reporter to tell you who was his source. Uh, reporters will not only not tell you that, they will also not help you in terms of eliminating possibilities. Uh, a few times in the Abscam cases and in some others, we have been able to locate leakers because uh, either the circumstantial evidence was so great 
that the attorney general or someone else felt comfortable acting on that quantum of circumstantial evidence, or in a few cases, people have admitted it. I mean, they've admitted um, that they were indeed the person who did it. But usually, in the particular situation that the professor puts, there is a very excellent report done on not quite that um, leak in, the, in that case, but another leak, which probably is related, in which um, you could come to a pretty informed judgment as to where it was coming from, but not with enough certitude so that you could fire the person or, or punish the person or group of people that were involved in it. Um, the only answer to it is if we want to make a different judgment and uh, balance the value somewhat differently, and after you get it down to the three or four people that it might be, actually put reporters in the grand jury and require them to give up their sources or go to prison. And um, that's a very difficult choice to make. And I'm not sure that when you balance one against the other, that's what we should be doing. Uh, but we're not going to have far much more success in controlling leaking or punishing it, although it should be, uh, unless we do that. There is one brighter side to it. And, that, and I found that this occurs, that, th that you can accomplish this at least. Uh, if you begin an investigation of leaking, uh, you, can at, you can at least frighten people into not doing it once the investigation begins. Uh, and that has had a tendency to cut it down in certain cases. But uh, unless you get lucky, you know, the, the people who are doing it are by and large going to deny it when they're questioned. They're going to say, no, it wasn't me. And then, of course, the way the report is done in the newspaper to protect the source is to make it purposely ambiguous. If um, um, not, only the, uh, not only the description, but a, a reporter who's trying to cover his source is obviously owes it to a source to try to make it as uh, ambiguous as possible. And therefore, it makes it very difficult not so much to suspect who the leaker is, even kind of to know, but it makes it very difficult to act on it in the sense of you'd never be able to impose a, a penalty on them because you can't prove it. Uh, sometimes uh, you can decide, well, I'm not going to deal with that group or that because I'm not going to make sure they don't get information. And then there are times in which, and Alan gets very upset when I say this, but it happens to be true, where the leaking is coming from the defense side and not uh, from the government side, and not just from the defendant in the case, but from the other witness, the lawyers from the other witnesses in the case who are trying to create a momentum to get someone uh, prosecuted. I'll give you a perfect example of this. We had, we had a, a, a leak a year ago of grand jury testimony in which uh, the grand jury testimony of two witnesses was laid out in the New York Post. I uh, read it in the morning and got incensed and angry and called in the assistants and the FBI agents who were working on the case and said, you know, this, uh, this couldn't possibly have happened. I know, I know the grand jury's not leaking. I mean, they've heard two years' worth of very sensitive information and it, it didn't come from them. And they wouldn't remember it with this kind of detail. And it was like question, answer, question, answer, question, answer. It has to be coming from, from us. And the defense lawyer of that particular witness is not going to leak this. It was very damaging things. And I said, it has to be. We, we, um, maybe we should have everybody take polygraph tests. Or, and the assistant just started laughing. And I thought he had gone crazy. I mean, why are you laughing like this? And he said, the reason I'm laughing is that neither one of those witnesses testified in the grand jury. They never got into the grand jury to testify. They came into my office. The testimony was proffered. And um, there were at least two or three people who were part of the team, including a lawyer for someone else, who knew about this because it related to four or five people. And they must have thought that the person, the people actually have gone into the grand jury and testified. They haven't been in the grand jury yet. They're not going to go in for a week. So we were able to get that down to three possible people who leaked that information. One was a defense lawyer, and two were government agents. And there's just no, and th all three deny it. And there's no way of knowing who, who it was. It had to have been someone, unless we really had a perverted creature involved, it had to be someone who believed that they were going to testify and didn't know they actually did not testify. Uh, I, think it's a, I think it is a very, uh, it, is, it is counterproductive and damaging to the government almost always uh, when there is leaking for a very practical reason. We are always better off investigating in secret rather than in public. It's always, it's always second best 
to be investigating in public because there are all sorts of investigatory techniques you can use in secret that you cannot use in public. And then we face the terrible problems of having to defend it. Um, uh, and who needs it? I mean, nobody, nobody needs it. One more question. Do I think that, do I, uh, first of all, I didn't know that my comment sounded like Governor Dukakis. I did not, I did not uh, plagiarize him for him, honestly. <laughs> um, do I think that uh, prosecution uh, would be a, a practical means to end tax evasion in the United States today? No, I don't think it's a practical means to end tax evasion. I think it's a necessary, it, it's something that is necessary to do, and hopefully it'll cut down some of it. Um, it is an area where deterrence can work, because tax evasion is a, a crime that people uh, deliberate about. Um, please, um, this is only a hypothetical, I mean, it's sort of a joke, but suppose the penalty for tax evasion were um, capital, capital punishment. I mean, suppose that, um, suppose that the rule was if the government could prove beyond a reasonable doubt, you know, nobody uncomfortable about the degree of proof, that the person evaded over a certain amount of taxes, let's say over $10,000 in taxes, the automatic penalty was you went to the electric chair. Don't you think that would have a dramatic effect on the amount of tax? I mean, people wouldn't, they wouldn't roll the dice with that kind of penalty sitting there as a possibility. Well, I don't think there should be capital punishment for tax evasion. I'm not advocating it. I don't think it would be constitutional or humane or decent or any of the other things. But it does give you, I think, some sense that um, the possibility of punishment can affect how people make those decisions as to whether or not they're going to take the risk of cheating. Um, and that's why prison is important in white collar offenses. Because if it becomes just a matter of dollars and cents, if it becomes, uh, I'll try to evade uh, this million or two million or five million in taxes, I probably will not get caught because the government can't catch everybody. If I do get caught, I've got enough money to fight it and Maybe they I reduce their chances of being able to convict me by some percentage over a poor person. And finally, if, if, if they do catch me and all the lawyers I hire can't get me out of it, all I have to do is pay back money. It becomes not a bad a gamble. And you have to, uh, unfortunately, it would be a lot better if we didn't, you have to intrude into that kind of thinking with the sense that you can get caught, you can get convicted, and if you do, you pay a penalty that you don't want to take the risk of paying, which is you lose your liberty for, for, a, for what appears to be at least a substantial period of time, or what should appear to be a substantial period of time. Um, and I think in the area of white-collar crime, uh, and in the area of violent crime, uh, where imprisonment is necessary uh, for immediate protection, but uh, you could debate what kind of general deterrent effect it has. Well, thank you very much. It was very interesting.